strategy filling in for Craig, who's traveling for our ministry this week. And I am excited to host the show with you today because we have a very special guest. We are going to bring on Congressman-elect Josh Burkeen. He just won his election for Oklahoma's second congressional district. And he's going to fill us in on some behind the scenes stuff about what happens after you win your election. Uh, oftentimes, after we, we pray for the election, sometimes we even get involved in elections in specific races. In this case, we actually endorsed Representative Josh Burkeen all the way back from when he was running for the primary. Um, and so now we're, we're excited to hear from him and what it really means and what happens after you win an election. Um, so, welcome to the show, Representative now, Josh Burkeen, how are you? How are you doing now that you've won your election? Uh, I'm, I'm blessed, uh, honored to join you. Uh, I am a fan of FPA and uh, Autumn, it is intense. I got elected, got a, a plane at 4 a.m. the next morning and have been in D.C. ever since, meeting after meeting after meeting and um, got another several days of meetings. Look forward to getting back and seeing my family. Um, it, uh, they, they say it, and you hear it 10 times if you've heard it once today, that you're drinking through a fire hydrant, trying to learn uh, not just where the bathrooms are, uh, parking garage, uh, how to get to an office, not just your office, which we don't even have yet. Um, and uh, just, you know, a high, high number of people that you've never seen. There's 435 members of Congress, not, not, not to mention all their staff, and uh, trying to put, put names with faces. I bet it is overwhelming, Representative. Um, and so, Representative Josh Burkeen, he's at freshman orientation right now in Washington, D.C. I bet you didn't ever think you'd be back at a freshman orientation. And so we need you, we need you all who are watching to please lift up Josh and his family as they go through this new journey of becoming a, a newly elected member of Congress. Um, so please also like and share this video because we want others to uh, hear about what it's like to become a Christian who's a newly elected member of Congress. Share this with your friends. Um, please like if you hear something that Josh says that's interesting that you are enjoying hearing. Um, but Josh, let's, let's back up for just one second. I want to hear, and I think our viewers would really enjoy hearing, why did you run in the first place? And what is it like to run for Congress as a, a, someone who is a believer and centered on the values that we all care about? So, I, as some on the, the call with FPA know, um, I had been um, in discussions about starting a family policy uh, council in Oklahoma for a number of years. Uh, a mentor of mine, uh, Tom Coburn, former United States Senator, uh, who's a friend, he had encouraged me to do that. In fact, my very last conversation with Tom Coburn before he passed away, the email was, what about focus? And he was talking about, of course, FPA. And so I felt like that, that maybe I was supposed to get back into public policy after leaving the state Senate, starting a small business, a dozer excavator uh, trucking business, and um, was kind of moving that direction um, as a person that believes in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. It says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. I felt this, this uh, you know, that, that still small voice as a Christian that, okay, I'm, I'm open, Lord, to get back involved in, in public policy, um, knowing that Psalms 20 says, in his name, I will raise my banner. Um, that that uh, conversation happened for a couple of years, and, and when this seat came open, I had set all the groundwork for kind of setting my heart in that direction. I told my wife, I said, maybe this is what we've been waiting for. Maybe... Maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe this, the sense I'm supposed to get back involved in some public policy. Maybe it's this. My wife uh, was dead set against it. And so praying and fasting off and on for a number of months, uh, 13 people had already gotten in the race. Two days before the filing deadline, my wife looked at me and said, I'm getting a piece about this. Um, we have, we had like a six month old at home. It was a huge decision. And uh, I said, is that a total yes? And she said, well, not total. Maybe I'm getting there. Three hours before the filing deadline, I'm in Oklahoma City waiting on my bride to tell me what should we do. And uh, she said, go file. I was 14th out of 14, had no money, had no consultants. <laughs> uh, it's a miracle that, that I got through a 14-way primary. Um, so it was nothing but, but uh, believing in Psalm 75 that promotion doesn't come from the east to the west. 
Well, I love hearing about that representative and I know uh, those watching will enjoy hearing about that as well, what it's like to run as, as a believer. Know that we are lifting you up in prayer, you and your family and your little one. Congratulations, I've got a little one too, so I know what that's like. But I just, I think that's so wonderful that you answered the call to serve. And I know you know this, but for our viewers, at Family Policy Alliance, we believe that when someone is called to serve in public office, that is another form of a mission field. And that we need to lift those who are serving in that mission field. It can be a very dark and difficult place. We need to lift them up in prayer. We need to support them. They need to support your campaigns for reelection. It's just like sending somebody out in the mission field. We know that in church, when we do that, when someone goes out to the mission field to tell others about uh, Jesus Christ in another country, we don't abandon them. We don't leave them without prayer and financing. Um, but it, here in the United States, when we send someone out to represent us and represent our values at the highest levels of government, we need to do the same thing. So no representative elective Burkine that we will be praying for you, lifting you up. And I wanna encourage our, encourage our viewers to do the same thing because it's not easy. You've just heard Representative Burkine talking about how I was drinking from a fire hose this week. There's all these different rules and procedures that you're going to have to learn about in the coming days and all these different folks you're going to have to meet and know their name and what makes them tick. Um, it's a it's a big lift. It's a big job. And so just know that we're with you. We're standing behind you. Um, but let's back up for a, for a second again, because you mentioned that you served two terms in the state Senate in Oklahoma. What are some of the lessons learned there that you plan to bring with you to Congress in Washington, D.C.? There are two types of people, Autumn, that I've seen in politics, those that are uh, politically calculated and those that, that operate from a conscience that drives their decision making. And I think that's the probably the greatest um, probably the greatest experience I have in working in the, in the state Senate is I, I know um, after looking at someone's fruit for a while, okay, I can, I, I kind of know where they're operating out of. And I, the challenge for me this time is I hope to love people to a greater level. There's a saying that says, you don't have to say a word. People can tell how you behold them in your subconscious. And so I want to be, uh, you know, as the Bible tells us that a good tree is known by its fruit, uh, to be able to recognize good fruit, uh, you know, group up with the, those that are, that you see good fruit in their life and be a, you know, part of, uh, locking uh, your shield with them and, uh, Moving forward, our nation's in trouble. We, we're going to have to have a course correct. It's our moral fabric that's crumbling underneath us, and, and our fiscal footing is, is crumbling because not only are we abandoning biblical truth on, on our morality and our culture, but uh, Washington, D.C. is also embracing a dead is wealth mentality that's making us a slave to the, uh, to the, uh, to the lender. And, and so to, to have the experience and know who's politically calculated, who is, who is conscious driven. And to those that are conscious driven, be there to, to be, you know, part of the group that's inspiring them to, to do the right thing and, and to be the, pe the people that if no one else will stand, will stand, but also to go to the people that are politically calculated, pull them aside and, and love them first and say, man, let's talk about our nation. Are we here for self-interest? Are we here for national interest? And so I hope to take that experience, uh, love people to a greater level, and, and hopefully see our nation turn. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. It reminds me, Representative Burkeen, you were actually an alumnus of our sister foundation, Statesman Academy. It's the exclusive, oh, wow. exclusive training program for state legislators on worldview, on uh, how to how to stick to your principles and your values once you actually hold office, um, how to rise in leadership while you are in office. So, for those watching who uh, aren't familiar with the Statesman Academy, can you share a little bit about that experience and what that was like for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, some of the things I just talked about, I, I know were highlighted in, in that. And, and Tom Coburn, who was a mentor, a friend, uh, when he was United States Senator, I served on the staff for six years, many years ago, almost not quite 20 years ago, but between 15 and 20 years ago. And I saw in Tom Coburn someone, and I think he's an anomaly. Um, there's a ditch on both sides. Some people, uh, you know, we get the, the, there's a false love doctrine that says don't stand and just love people. Okay. That's, First Corinthians 13 talks about that love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. So our definition of love has to match First Corinthians 13. It can't just be that we um, compromise and we love everyone and we don't have absolute truths. And so you have to have absolute truths 
as as a part of loving someone. It does not does not rejoice in righteousness, but rejoices in the truth. That's God's definition of love. And what I watched Tom Coburn do is he took hard stance. He was principled, but then he still loved people. And when he made a mistake and maybe he was too harsh or maybe he said something he regretted about somebody, he would humble himself. He would go and, and apologize to that person in private and, and get and, and restore the relationship and operate out of reconciliation. And so we have to be uh, people in, in a high level of intensity in politics that demonstrate uh, the love of Jesus, but it's not the ditch of false love that, that we tolerate um, sin, but nor is it the ditch of I, I stand so uh, harsh and, and, and rough that I drive people away because it's not what I'm saying, it's how I'm saying it, that I come across mean-spirited and so there's a ditch on both sides, and, and you've got to stand. That's why the Bible says, speak the truth in love. It's both. We speak the truth. We do it in love. And that doesn't mean everyone's going to like you. There are going to be people, that, you know, the 10 10 rule, that is 10% of the people you meet, they're not going to like you, and they don't know why to begin with. And then 10% of the people who first meet you, they're going to love you, and they don't know why. And then there's that 80% that you have the opportunity to influence. And that's why Jesus calls us to be fishermen and to be able to fish and use tactics um, tactics of stepping on people's toes without messing up their shine, speak the truth in love. Very, very well said, Congressman. And I love that you brought up Senator Coburn from your state. He was one in a million. And that's why now at the at the Foundation Statesman Academy, we actually give away one award. It's called the, the Coburn Statesmanship Award, one award to an outstanding lawmaker, elected leader every single year. We've named it for him because of exactly what you described of uh, his lessons of leadership and how he led in love. That's extremely well said. He's a wonderful example, and I love that you're kind of following in his footsteps, carrying his banner forward as you take your seat in Congress. That's very exciting. So I'm um, reminding me of something that occurred in 2017. When I was at your Statesman Academy, uh, I believe it was in Colorado Springs on the Focus on Family uh, old campus, Tom Coburn and I were there together. And it was one of my very last, I think it was one of my very last um, uh, times with him live before he passed away. And uh, I love that man. He was incredible. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. We have uh, so many video recordings of him and his teachings have carried on through the Academy every single year. He was with us from the beginning when we first launched the Academy in 2016. And his values and the teachings that he gave have carried on forward through present, through this year's Academy that we had in July. Um, so that's exactly right. He's a wonderful, wonderful example. Um, so with that, as you're sort of carrying that mantle forward into Congress, Representative, it's looking like we're going to have conservatives are going to have the majority in the new Congress once that takes session on January 3rd. Can you tell us what some of your top priorities will be as you take your first seat as congressman of the second district of Oklahoma? So, so I'm going to find people that are recognizing that morally we have an issue. And so to, to stand with the people that I know are, are people that have biblical virtue. Uh, virtue meaning moral excellence and to surround myself with those people and to stand on the on the issues that are um, all too often people are not standing when it comes to biblical virtue so i'll be looking for those but in my in my uh um just uh the passion that has so engulfed me i can't even explain it it is the things that I've, i learned from tom coburn about fiscal restraint when he was talking about seven trillion dollar national debt being our undoing and now we're at 31 trillion I know, apart from standing on biblical virtue, that there are not too many people that are seeing what's ahead of us. The Congressional Budget Office says that within a decade, we will have trillion dollar annual interest payments on our debt. We pre-COVID brought in a, a, about uh, uh, 3.5 trillion in revenue and spent 4.5 trillion. So we're spending about trillion dollars a year. But by the end of the decade, CBO saying we're going to be just spending an, addition, an additional from what is $350 billion now to a trillion dollars on interest payments. It's not sustainable. And so Peter Peterson Foundation, the, the CBO, and uh, the Office of Management and Budget are all saying that by, by 2050, half of our entire federal budget will be just interest payments on the debt. 
And so that's what I'm most uh, concerned about. Um, that is a moral issue, it's just generational theft. Uh, every man, woman, and child who opens, uh, or who is alive today, owes ninety thousand dollars. Just, just their share of that, of that thirty-one trillion. That means a baby who's born in a hospital opens its eyes, takes in its first breath of air, and it owes ninety thousand dollars as its share of the national debt. But I'm going to break it down for you a little bit longer, or a little bit further. That's just the thirty-one trillion. The when you look at Medicare insolvency, which is going to hit us in about five years, according to the actuarial analysis. There's a $35 trillion hole in Medicare. We have a $20 trillion hole in Social Security. It becomes insolvent in 11 years. With what we owe federal employees on pension, veterans, pensions. Um, thank you, veterans. And then in terms of the additional 20 different trust programs that we've borrowed an IOU out of, the, we are $120 trillion sum total debt liability. And what the United States Treasury report that came out in June said, is that if you put all of those unfunded liabilities and you put it against all assets in America today, it's 80% of all assets in America today, that $120 trillion. They say it's even down to pieces of furniture. The chair that I'm sitting in, even down to pieces of furniture, all assets in America, 80%. We're in trouble. Um, if there's no enemy on the inside, the enemy on the outside can't do you any harm. This structural deficit, annual, uh, debt loading and selling our children into bondage. We've got to address it and we've got to have courage to do that. And it's going to take making cuts and nobody wants to hear that. But the only way that we're going to be able to get out of this is yes, have a, a roaring economy, but we're also going to have to cut the, the, the behemoth of the federal government that, that uh, we're replacing our dependence on, on God and, and we've become a, a nation that is dependent upon the, the dole of the federal government. Those are staggering numbers, Congressman. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for making that a top priority. And I think you're right. I mean, we are pro-life, pro-family, and that is a pro-life, pro-family issue because as you said, if we are gonna be pro-life, then from the moment that baby is born, you're saying, did you say 90,000? That's just the 31 trillion. You break the 31 trillion dollars down. That's that's not inclusive of the, uh, of the other uh, 90 trillion of unfunded liabilities. That's just the 31 trillion public debt. And so that baby opens its eyes and takes in its first breath of air. I've got a year old. And when I would hold her praying about running for office, my question, I could probably get emotional if I don't, if I don't, I won't stop myself. So I don't get emotional saying this on this, on this interview. And I do this when I ask this question, but I'd hold her and, uh, and I would uh, hold her and I would ask the question, um, how can I be a good dad to you? But I knew the training I had with Tom Coburn and I knew I was accountable for that. And I knew with what I knew with what he was talking about, um, that he saw something that no one else was seeing 20 and 30 years ago. Uh, I knew I was accountable. And, uh, and so I knew to be a good dad to her meant to go to, to Washington DC. If that's what I was feeling led to do. And if it was what we ultimately decided that I would be being a good dad to her by I'm making sure she's got time with me when I'm home, I'm all with my other kiddos, but securing her future because the Constitution, our mission statement says to secure the blessing of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. That's in the preamble. We're all about ourselves in this, in this culture, and we are throwing posterity aside. That's so powerful, Congressman. And that's right. We are pro-life all the way through. And that means we want to make sure those babies have the right to be born, have the right to take that first breath, right. have the right to uh, the, all the, the opportunities that we want for our children. We want to make sure those are secure, that they have education that meets their needs, but also that we're not saddling them with mountains and mountains of debt. So that is that is extremely powerful. Thank you for taking that on. Um, I've got one last question for you, and we always like to end on a note of encouragement in this show. So, Congressman, it's a two-part question. So first, share with our viewers, if someone is considering running for office, whether that's at the local school board or all the way up to Congress, Senate, President, whatever it is, what is something that you can say to encourage those folks who might be, might be considering a run now that you've just won your first yeah. election as Congressman? So I would say check and make sure that, this, that ambition is not driving. This, this town and, and your state capitals are full of people that are ambitious. And if you read the book of James, it says, where you find ambition and jealousy, you'll find every other disorder. And I would tell you in my time in the state capitol and what 
what little I know about Washington, D.C. when I worked for Tom Coburn and what I'm experiencing now is ambition in politics is destructive. You know, ambition in the free market makes me hustle, makes me get up early. Um, that's 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 a that's a type of ambition. But political ambition is where you put the your your own personal interest and your own climbing of the of the, the ladder in the wrong ahead of what's you know in the interest of, of your state or in this situation I find myself in, 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 in for the for your nation. John Adams uh, wrote a letter in eighteen uh, early eighteen hundreds, and uh, actually it was in the eighteen hundreds. It was seventeen ninety eight, just prior. And he wrote to the Massachusetts militia, and he says, we have no government armed with power capable of contending with human passions unbridled by religion and morality. And then his next statement, Autumn, is, is where I'm going with this. He says, avarice, which means extreme greed, which is, I will contend, is why we uh, have the debt loading that we have. Avarice, ambition, and revenge and gallantry will break the strongest cords of our constitution as a whale goes through a net. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate to the government of any other. What John Adams was saying is if you find ambition, you're gonna, you're gonna bust our constitution. It goes in tandem with what Samuel Adams said. He said that neither the wisest of constitution nor the wisest of laws can secure the, the, the liberty and happiness of a people whose manners are universally corrupt. And so to be someone who has a biblical worldview, are you driven by your own ambition? Are you driven by Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which says, lean not on your own understanding, but all your ways acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. And so if what you're doing is because of a calling, God will have your back, and he'll go before you. If what you're doing is out of ambition, and you go, hey, God, I'll kind of cut a deal with you. This is what I can do for you. I'll run for office, and I'll make you look good. Then I would challenge that person. You better get you better get centered because I've seen a lot of people that call themselves Christian, but there's levels of fruit on the tree, and sometimes the, the, you can have fruit, but it's not ripe fruit. It's old fruit because you've not been staying with the Word. Psalms one: Blessed is he who sits not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the path of sinners, or, or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, upon which he meditates day and night. For he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of living water. You better make sure on a daily basis that you are in touch with your Savior, that you have a personal relationship because ambition is going to be knocking at your door. And you better close the door on that because too, too often people choose a path of ambition over conscience. Oh, if I get this chairmanship, then then I'll be more effectual. Well, what Tom Coburn taught me was leadership is not a title. Leadership is what you do. And uh, I'll end with this. Uh, Dr. Coburn used to take Martin Luther King Jr.'s quote, which said that cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And if you'll be led because you've submitted your life to Jesus, and you submitted your life to his following, and you'll be led by uh, what you know is, is uh, God's prompting, not your own selfish ambition prompting, then you'll stay the course. Um, but there's one thing to say I'm a Christian. It's another thing to let the, the Lord truly be Lord and let him lead. Amen. Representative, I think you just preached a sermon, even though you're an elected leader. I think you just preached a sermon for us. That's so good. And that, I think, for our viewers, that's that's the difference. When you have congressmen like Josh Burkeen serving who are true believers, they are following and seeking after the Lord Jesus Christ first and foremost, and serving as a form of their calling and their mission um, in their elected office, as opposed to seeking something for themselves or for power or for politics or money or whatever it is, that's the difference. That's what we're trying to help believers in, and instill in them through the, our sister foundation state Academy, the values that they can take with them into elected office. And that is the, the difference that we're trying to see where we have believers really following after the Lord, changing government from the inside out. So thank you, Congressman. And then my last question for you, part B, this is how we, how can we as believers who are not serving in elected office, how can we support and encourage you, your family and other believers serving in elected public office? So I also worked at a camp called Canacuck years ago. It's some, some of your viewers will be like, oh, I sent their kids there. I was doc daddy at Canacuck camps for two years, K2. Um, I'll never forget Joe White, uh, president founder. He was tied in heavily with James Dobson and focused on the family. I'll never forget him saying, uh, prayer is the job. It's not just job preparation. Prayer is the job. It's not just job preparation. I think as believers, we all too often um, you know, think, oh, it's what I'm doing. And it is what we do when we, after we've prayed and we know it's what we're supposed to do. 
so I would say to to to, to hitch and eats, and as we know by history that that uh, the the James the brother half brother of Jesus had they called him said he had uh, knees like a camel because he was constantly on his knees. That we'd be devoted to prayer, we'd be devoted to to seeking the Lord's plan for our nation. Um, God has a plan for this nation. Uh, Ronald Reagan, when he ran for president, started off his, his famous rendezvous with destiny speech, which says, "Our nation is hungering for a spiritual revival." And then he went on to quote what I believe is Psalms 44 and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he said, "But our nation has a choice: either we will become a byword among the nations, or a city upon a hill." He was actually quoting John Winthrop. Uh, the Puritan leader in 1620 on the decks of the Arabella who was forecasting the same thing, that America can be something different. We can be a shining city on the hill or it can be a byword among the nation. It's its its, its choice. And so it's our adherence to biblical principles that sets, has set us apart for 200 years. And so my request is you, those listening, that you would join me, my wife, uh, my family in praying for a great spiritual revival as Ronald Reagan talked about when he ran for president. Politics is downstream of culture. If this culture will change, stop becoming a me first, me centered culture and a culture that's willing to sacrifice the next generation. And we can course correct, uh, but it won't happen without our pulpits flaming with righteousness. Amen again. And I would encourage for those of you who are listening, will you give this video a like or a love if you can commit to praying for revival, just as Representative Burkeen is praying for revival? Will you give it a like or a love if you can commit to praying for Representative Burkeen and his family and other believers serving in Congress, serving in your state legislature, serving in your school board? These men and women, just like missionaries that we send out onto the field, they need our prayers. So that is my request just humbly before you as a representative of Family Policy Alliance, asking you all to join us in prayer for these godly men and women serving in, in public office. They need our prayers. And as Representative Burkeen said, of course, of course, our nation needs revival. Um, so with that, Representative Burkeen, I know you've got to get back to your freshman orientation, so we'll send you out, but definitely with our prayers and love and support, may God be with you and your family, and may he be uh, a very great help and comfort to you and a guidance to you as you go out in your freshman orientation, as you take your first seat in Congress starting on January 3rd. Thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you so much to the viewers for watching. Thank you, Autumn.